This is a short video on hiatal hernia. I'll be talking about the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations for hiatal hernia. As in all of these videos, each of the boxes is color-coded according to this legend in the top right, and I'll be clearing all of the boxes and repopulating the flowchart as we talk about each concept. Let's go ahead and get started. We'll start with the definition of hiatal hernia. Hiatal hernia is a protrusion of an abdominal structure into the thorax through the diaphragmatic esophageal hiatus. So this diaphragmatic esophageal hiatus is the hole through which the esophageal passes through the diaphragm. And when you have a piece of the abdominal structure, something from the abdomen poking through it, it's a hiatal hernia. Now usually, this abdominal structure that we're talking about is a portion of the stomach. That's in 95 plus percent of cases. So that's really what we're gonna be focusing on here. Now we're gonna work our way back to the etiologies of hiatal hernia first. There are two major things that contribute to a hiatal hernias. First, you can have a lax diaphragmatic esophageal hiatus, so that opening is weak. It's not as tight as it should be, it's lax. Secondly, you can have increased intra-abdominal pressure um, and that can come from a variety of causes. There's a lot of things in the abdomen, and a lot of things in the abdomen can be high in pressure, which can predispose you to a hiatal hernia. So let's keep working our way back. First, in terms of things that cause a lax diaphragmatic esophageal hiatus, age is the first risk factor. As we get older, our phrenoesophageal ligament weakens, and that's what predisposes you to having this hiatal hernia. Smoking is another risk factor. If you smoke, you end up with weaker elastin fibers in the diaphragmatic crura. Now the diaphragmatic crura are these connections, these tendons between the diaphragm to the vertebral column. There are two of them, and they're pretty important for maintaining the strength of that esophageal hiatus. Obesity is another risk factor. When you're gaining too much weight, when you have too much fat, you end up depositing fat in and around the crura, and that widens the hiatus. So the crura play two roles here. They can either be damaged when you smoke, or they can have a bunch of fat deposited around them and become widened um, in obesity. Lastly, there's some component of genetic predisposition that also predisposes you to having a weak hiatus as well. Um, that's not super well understood. Next, let's discuss the etiologies that cause increased, uh, increased intra-abdominal pressure. Chronic constipation is one. If you have a lot of stuff in your bowel, if you have a lot of stool in your bowel and you're constantly straining, that's high intra-abdominal pressure. If you have COPD and you're chronically coughing, that can increase your intra-abdominal pressure over a long period of time. Liver disease as well, like cirrhosis, can cause ascites, which of course is fluid buildup in the abdomen, which can increase the pressure. And pregnancy, of course, having a fetus growing in your uterus can increase your intra-abdominal pressure for a long time. There are also congenital diaphragmatic hernias, and these can cause defects in the pleuroperitoneal membrane. That can also predispose you to hiatal hernias, but these are rather rare causes. Um, usually hiatal hernias are acquired, whereas congenital diaphragmatic hernias cause problems in infancy that require repair much earlier in life as a pediatric patient. We're largely focusing on the adult population for hiatal hernias. Now, when we talk about the pathophysiology and manifestations of hiatal hernia, it's helpful to have this diagram up to see exactly what we're talking about. And there's four diagrams here, and I'll label them all and talk through them briefly, and then talk about how the pathophysiology and manifestations relates to these two pathologies. So first, this first diagram is the normal anatomy. The diagram, or the diaphragm on this diagram is labeled in pink, and the esophagus is labeled in green. This pink structure is the stomach, of course. Notice in the normal anatomy how the angle between the, the esophagus and the stomach makes this sharp acute angle. In the pre-stage for a hiatal hernia, that angle becomes much wider, becomes more obtuse, as you can see here. So that's a hiatal hernia waiting to happen. The last two are type one and type two hiatal hernias. Type one is called sliding and type two is called paraesophageal. And we'll go into more detail on both of those. So first, for type one, sliding hiatal hernia, this is when you have the gastroesophageal junction and the gastric cardia slide up into the posterior mediastinum. So you can see this gastroesophageal junction, the GEJ, is now above the diaphragm, and that's pathologic. That's not good. In addition, you have the gastric fundus, this part of the stomach right here, that remains below the diaphragm. So you end up with this hourglass stomach shape, where the stomach is kind of compressed by the 
by the esophageal hiatus and it turns into this hourglass shape. Now type 2 parasophageal hiatal hernia has kind of the opposite. You have the gastric fundus that's poking up into the thorax and the gastroesophageal remains in its proper position below the diaphragm. So they're kind of opposites in this way. It depends on which uh, side the gastroesophageal junction is on and which side the gastric fundus is on. Now let's lead into the manifestations. What causes symptoms in type 1 sliding hiatal hernia? First, you have a loss of barrier reflex. Um, this is, when, when you have gastric reflux, it's largely prevented by this angle of the esophagus to the stomach, as well as it all being below the lower esophageal sphincter and all being below the diaphragm. In type 1 sliding hiatal hernia, you lose all that. Your gastroesophageal junction is now above the diaphragm, and that can predispose you to getting gastroesophageal reflux. In addition, you're also compromising your fluid emptying of the distal esophagus. Now normally your distal esophagus dumps easily into the stomach. In this case, it's not so easy because you have this um, hiatus that's kind of pinching the stomach and it can lead to accumulation of fluid here, preventing your distal esophagus from emptying properly. So both of these, as I already mentioned, can lead to gastroesophageal reflux disease and that can present with a variety of symptoms. This includes heartburn, regurgitation, cough, chest pain, difficulty swallowing, you can have a feeling of food stuck in your throat, vomiting, sore throat, and hoarseness. Now, the parasophageal hiatal hernia will have slightly different symptoms. Because you have this piece of the stomach that's kind of pinched up, the fundus of the stomach is above the diaphragm, that can cause pain. You can have epigastric or substernal pain. You can also have early satiety, since your stomach is now smaller than it was before, um, you can become full faster. And because your stomach is smaller than it was before, you can have retching as well. This can cause vomiting. It's also possible for the type 2 hiatal hernia to cause GERD symptoms. So that's not um, out of the question, although it is less common than in the type 1 hiatal hernia. Now lastly, there are some complications that are worth knowing with type 2. This can cause gastric ulcers. It can also cause gastric perforation. Both of these things can lead to an upper GI bleed. It could either be a sudden bleed where you see the blood, or it could be a more uh, surreptitious bleed where the patient is bleeding slowly over the time. In any case, this can lead to an iron deficiency anemia, which includes anemia symptoms and anemia labs. And there's this strange presentation, this strange uh, concept, a gastric volvulus, where the stomach kind of twists on itself. And that can also happen from the type 2 parasophageal hiatal hernia. Lastly, I've put all of these in gray because you can actually see the different hernias from imaging, and it's important to know which types of imaging you might use to identify the type of hiatal hernia that you're dealing with. Most common is barium swallow and endoscopy. Those are the best tests, but you might also be able to identify them on chest x-ray and CT scans as well. This has been a short overview of hiatal hernia. I hope it was helpful, and thank you for listening.